Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines is one of my favorite games of all time. No surprises there if you follow my channel. And as such, it's also one of those games that I've played through more times than I can count, alongside titles like Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, Planescape Torment, and Mass Effect. But there are only so many times that you can play a game before it gets a little bit stale, and over the years I've used a lot of mods to spice things up. There are things like the Camarilla Edition mod, which is a total overhaul that's meant to make you feel more like a vampire, all while bringing the game a little bit more closer to the tabletop rules. The controversial Anti-Tribute mod, which completely changes the playable clans to bring in many options not aligned with the Camarilla, along with their signature disciplines. And the final Knights mod, which is such a radical departure from the base game that they even opted to drop the Bloodlines moniker from the game's title. And that's not even to mention a slew of smaller mods as well, like character model reskins and sound overhauls. But out of all of these mods, there's only one that I keep coming back to more often than not anytime I have an itch to play through this masterpiece of the game one more time. And that mod is the Clan Quest mod by Burgermeister01. I mentioned all the way back in my Bloodlines review that I consider the Clan Quest mod to be essential for the game, even on a first time playthrough. Though I can understand why some people disagree with me, I still stand by that statement. The Clan Quest mod is the closest thing that we've ever gotten to a full-on expansion pack for the game. In any case, I wanted to take a look at this mod a little bit more in depth and explain exactly why I hold it in such high regard. While I don't normally review mods, I think that the Clan Quest mod is something of an exception that definitely deserves a spotlight. As a note to any newcomers, I won't be looking at the base game very much at all in this video, but I did gush about it at length previously. So if you're interested in learning more about Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines itself, check out my review slash love letter on it. Also, I'm going to be trying to avoid any major spoilers about this mod, but if you don't want that ruined for you, then come back to this video later. So without further ado, let's take a look at the Clan Quest mod for Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. The very first version of the Clan Quest mod was originally released all the way back in 2009. The version that I'm playing, and the most up-to-date version as of making this video, is version 4.1, which itself was released in May of 2019. As the mod's name implies, and as you may have guessed, its original intention was to add several new quests to the game, one for each of the seven playable clans. On top of this, it offers a handful of additional content, mostly in the forms of general quests available to everybody. Some of these quests are based on your humanity level, some are follow-ups to already existing quests. The mod also includes several new NPCs, most of whom have voice dialogue, and additional events and some other goodies. While this is already great all by itself, version 4.1 expands this even further by adding a brand new hub area, the ability to join a new faction, new endings, and some significant gameplay overhauls, including the ability to diablerize many of the game's NPCs in a bid to become an even more powerful creature of the night. Like most Bloodlines total overhauls, the Clan Quest mod is built upon Wesp 5's unofficial patch, and uses that content as a foundation for all the extra goodies that it brings to the table. However, the changes made in Clan Quest mod are so extensive that it's impractical to constantly update them every time there's a new unofficial patch released. As it stands, the Clan Quest mod uses the unofficial patch plus version 9.2 which itself offers many additions to the base game, like a brand new quest and new locations. The Clan Quest mod also includes a number of smaller mods as well, all of which are optional systems that can be toggled on or off during installation. As a result, you can tailor the game's options to your liking, and you're not shoehorned into playing the game with settings you may not necessarily want to, but those who do, can. This also ensures at least a modicum of compatibility with multiple mods, so it's a nice thing that you can combine them without breaking everything. Some of these smaller mods include graphical additions, like the new loading screens and the X20 mod, which is a texture mod that brings the visuals more in line with the 20th anniversary edition of the tabletop game, new weapon sounds, and an optional achievement system, if you're into that. Others are more extensive, like the Arsenal mod, which completely redoes the game's weaponry and makes it a little bit harder as a result. There's also a Companion mod, which allows you to use certain NPCs as companions, and even place them around the world and pose with them. And a light version of the aforementioned Camarilla mod, which lets you keep some of those gameplay changes along with the new content offered in CQM. That way you get the best of both worlds. The nice thing about the Clan Quest mod is that it uses a mod loader, which means that the mod files are copied over into their separate subdirectories and can be launched independently of other mods. These mod folder directories will still launch universal assets from the game's main asset folder, so if there's something like a character skin that you really like and you want it to be consistent among all of your mods, all you have to do is dump it into that directory and it's going to be loaded regardless of which mod shortcut you use. And with all that, you're ready to play the mod. 
Like I said before, the main attraction of the mod is the slew of new quests that are included with it. The mod was originally designed for those exclusive quests, but it's expanded significantly since its inception, and it includes a number of quests that aren't locked to whichever clan you're playing. These quests all have different triggers and different prerequisites, like an evil questline that you can only accept if your humanity is low enough, or by witnessing a robbery by finding a $20 bill in the back of a convenience store, or an entire chain of events that creates a little bit of a substory if you complete the traffic quest for Fat Larry. One of my favorite quests by far is called the Dance of the Thrashing Dragon. Not because it's very involved from a gameplay perspective, but more because it's a series of dialogues with a Kuei Jin character that pulls back the curtain a little more on that faction, short of reading the Kindred of the East books and a couple of its supplements. It's a quest carefully crafted to further explore the world of darkness and expose players to some of its deeper lore, but it's done so in a way that feels very natural, and the associated NPC fits very easily into the game. It's very introspective and very personal, and I think it does a great job of opening up the doors to these other aspects of the world of darkness that many people may not be aware of. This is true for more or less all of the content that's introduced with the mod. You can tell that these stories were written by somebody who has a very deep appreciation of the source material outside of just the immediacy of the video game that you're playing. Moreover, the level of consistency between the mod's writing and the game's original tone is spot on, and it feels as if the mod integrates seamlessly into the game. It's a natural extension of the content already in the game, and it only serves to offer players more facets of Vampire the Masquerade to explore. The only major blemish when it comes to this new content is the inconsistency of the voice acting. Burgermeister01 has actually gone out of his way to hire semi-professional voice actors to breathe life not only into these new characters, but also added spoken dialogue for existing NPCs. Some of these impressions are actually pretty good, though you can easily tell that they're different people voicing the characters. And despite sounding different, it didn't take me out of the game at all since the performances given were really solid. That makes the rest of this so much easier. I give you my thanks, Kindred. You've served your prince well. Other performances, however, I think raise the bar for modding completely. The voice actors for Andre, and to a lesser extent Strauss, are phenomenal. Andre in particular was a major highlight since he sounded almost on par to Steve Blum's original depiction of the character. I will kill or drive the Nosferatu from their pestilent nests without the sewer rats to guide them. The Camarilla will be blind to the Sabbat's designs. I see the weariness in your eyes. You grow tired of the yoke the dusty elders of the Camarilla have thrown on your back. You squander your time, heaving their dead weight forward. And for what? A few of the game's existing NPCs, such as Nines, Gary, and Bertram, are all completely unvoiced, which I'm assuming is because they couldn't find suitable actors for them. These examples are relatively few and far between, though they do crop up a lot during the Sabbat storyline, so expect to see them there. Not that this was a deal breaker by any means as far as I'm concerned. As far as the new NPCs go, there are some seriously great standout performances that sucked me right into the game. Kellyanne, Victoria, and especially Hazel Tome were awesomely done, and I think the latter two brought this sinister, creepy edge that you expect from the Sword of Cain. I think Hazel's voice actor in particular had a lot of fun doing his role, since he is everything I expect an insane vampiric preacher to be. You treacherous swine! You bring famine and pestilence upon my house, but I shall bloody my hands with war and death! The other NPCs vary in terms of ability, but none of them were by any means bad. Some, like Lorenzo, the Mac, and Ariana are all quite solid, but not exceptional, and the others are merely okay. The only character voice that I think was downright terrible was an NPC that spawns if you undergo the Hitman quest chain. I don't know if it was the quality of the recording, or the mixing, or if my game was bugged, but the audio quality and the voice reading from him was awful. <sighs> I thought we were done here. As a whole, however, the voiced NPCs are a welcome addition to the game and they do a lot to increase that level of immersion. In conjunction with that is a series of well-written quests that follow a strong design philosophy and offer a series of meaningful choices and consequences, not to mention multiple methods to complete them, as one would expect from an RPG as robust as Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. 
The scope of these quests follow logical actions that for the most part work within the context of the universe. For instance, the Venture quest starts off by having you assassinate a member of the local Anarchs, but it quickly turns into a game of theft and conspiracy and politicking with a member of an enemy sect who actually shows up at the end of the game to fulfill the terms of his bargain if you strike a deal with them. It's wonderfully Vampire the Masquerade in its evolution from simple premise to multifaceted underlay. Or even the Bruja quest, which involves a show of loyalty to the Anarchs by sneaking into the Tremere Chantry and stealing an occult object. Now, the key word here is sneak. If you do what I did and kick the doors down, go in guns blazing, and kill Strauss and his minions, the quest giver's reaction is the appropriate level of shock and revulsion that the situation logically warrants. There has been a lot of care put into making sure that each of the links in these quest chains makes sense on a narrative level, and is consistent with the logical cohesion of the world of darkness. On a more gamey level, it takes into consideration character decisions in a similar way that the base game does, and it appropriately plays them out. What I thought was an oversight in seeing Strauss during the Sabbat endgame after previously killing him during the Bruja quest is actually addressed in a dialogue option that makes sense given the context of him being a powerful elder vampire sorcerer, and on a technical level, it serves as a workaround for the pro programming required to change the chapter completely should he be truly dead. It's a compromise that's well done without undermining any player decision making. It's just a shame that the final fight didn't exhibit this though. He just sort of teleported around the room and cowered a little bit after I killed his guards. I think the fight was bugged a little bit. Technical issues and bugs aside, the amount of programming that's gone into making all of this functional is nothing short of amazing. The scripting, asset placement, and design of this mod is remarkable. It even goes so far as to create all new cutscenes that just ups its quality all that much more. And none of that's even to mention a lot of the new features that come with version 4.1. This version pushes the technical threshold even further with major gameplay changes to the core experience. The biggest and most exciting change to the gameplay is the inclusion of the Diablerie mechanic. If you're not aware of Diablerie, it basically refers to the act of consuming the soul of another vampire, and thereby absorbing their powers and abilities. In the game, you're given a number of opportunities to do this to a handful of NPCs, provided that you've joined the Sabbat, because this is just something that doesn't jive with the Camarilla's rules. Fighting these select NPCs and bringing them down to half health results in a dialogue that allows you to feed from them, or kill them outright. If you opt to feed from them, you not only get a random stat buff based on the attributes of the character that you diablerize, but you also get a random dot in one of the disciplines that the character in question knew. Through this method, you can actually expand the suite of your vampiric powers and learn disciplines that aren't otherwise available to the clan that you're playing. However, if your own abilities are greater than that of the consumed NPC, you might not get anything out of it since you can't actually choose what gets buffed. It's all random. God, just no, no, no. However, Diablerie also means that you need to be able to subdue the other vampire's ego, otherwise you can find yourself in a situation where you're no longer in direct control of your vampire's body. In game terms, that means that you're haunted by the felled vampire's soul, and you're subject to even more random frenzy checks as you progress through the game. When you Diablerize a character, you enter a dialogue with their ghost, and you can try to subdue them by convincing them that being a passenger in your body is in their best interests one way or the other. The thresholds for these dialogue options and how many false leads a character may or may not have depends largely on their sensibilities, so you'd best approach them with caution. Diablerizing anybody incurs not only an automatic loss of a humanity point, but also a permanent reduction to your total humanity, making it all the easier to get a game over by eschewing any sense of morality that you have, similar to what happens when you get 5 Masquerade Breaches in the original game. Which, along with the general overhauls to the humanity system, works very well in driving home the consequences of any potential murder sprees one might undergo. In the original game, it was actually impossible for your humanity to drop below 3 points. But the Clan Quest mod has actually reworked it and made it fall more in line with how morality is handled in the tabletop game. Rather than a black and white system, in which case evil actions will always make you lose humanity regardless of where your own moral compass is, your actions are now based on your current humanity ranking, roughly corresponding to this handy chart right over here. What this means then, is if you have four dots of humanity and you steal something from someone, you no longer lose a dot of humanity as you would in the vanilla game, since it's not relative to your current moral outlook. Good actions will still redeem you regardless, but you can only have up to the maximum value of your total humanity pool, which is 10 for anybody who hasn't committed Diablery. And unlike the base game, you can no longer buy dots of humanity to offset this. Well, you can, but you likely won't be able to do it without cheating since they now cost 100 experience dots a pop. If you don't want to lose this game by becoming a mindless beast, you gotta find other ways to keep your humanity up. 
And all this is especially true if you opt to follow the mod's all-new storyline and join the Sabbat, which is by and large the real meat of the latest version of the mod. The amount of effort it has taken to create a brand new storyline that integrates as naturally and as easily as it does into the base game, and extends that story with as much consistency and quality as this does, is absolutely astounding. In order to join the Sabbat, you're going to need to progress with the game until your first meeting with Andre at the mansion on 609 King's Way. During the conversation before your fight, you'll be given a few chances to ask him about his plan and express interest in joining the Sabbat. Doing so will task you with the option to kill Gary, the Nosferatu primogen. From here, you can still back out and proceed with the game as normal. However, if you do choose to fight Gary and you bring him down to half health, you've gone down the path of no return and you've embraced the Sword of Cain. After your fight, Gary will escape and inform the rest of the Camarilla of your betrayal. From here, you'll be instructed to head over to East LA and find yourself a pack to roll with. And I gotta say, I love this hub. Burgermeister 01 has captured an area that just feels rife with poverty and desperation and is everything I expect when I think of a place where legal and political neglect have created the perfect breeding ground for monsters overlooking their mortal chattel. It has a series of row houses right down the middle, surrounded by a rundown strip mall and an old Spanish church on one side. There are some slightly nicer houses on the other, one of which doubles as a brothel, but they're still really run down and raggedy. The area itself is about the same size as Hollywood, maybe a little bit bigger, and it comes with its own theme song. At first I thought this was an original composition, but digging through the game's files reveals a series of emails between Burgermeister01 and Bloodlines composer Rick Schaefer, who confirms that he originally wrote the music for the base game when the original developers were actually kicking around an idea for East LA themselves. According to one of the emails by Rick, I was thinking Hispanic influence Nines Rodriguez with Open Season. Open Season would have been that area's main theme. There are a few other unused tracks here as well, and I think there's a few that are original compositions, but either way, the resurfacing of these tracks and their use for the mod's new hub does a great job of giving this area its own unique flavor, one that fits in really nicely with the rest of the game, while still feeling very unique in and of itself. This also extends to the new characters that you encounter, too. While in East LA, two characters will be vying for your help in overthrowing the other, and your choice actually has several ongoing outcomes for the rest of the game. You can either throw your weight behind the suave and manipulative Setite drug queen Victoria, or the mad Malkavian priest Hazel. The storyline for this area is very linear, and while I was hoping that it would branch out a little more, it's ultimately not a bad thing that it doesn't. The general events follow a very straightforward progression, and while you do have a choice of which of these two branching paths to follow, the outcome is more or less the same. Still, with the strength of the character writing and the acting, whichever path you choose is not going to leave you disappointed at the story revelations that follow. The plot itself is rich and very well paced, and I loved watching it progress into a climactic crescendo that ended in true Sabbat fashion. There are a few things that I wish were done a little bit differently, but they do not bring down my opinion of the quality of this content whatsoever. The only downside, I think, is that it's a little too easy to get locked down one of these two paths without realizing it. There's no moment of truth or any indication that accepting one of the two quests that you're given means that you're sent down a certain path, which could disappoint some first-time players. But there are walkthroughs for the mod posted on the Planet Vampire website, so at the very least, there's documentation that exists to help out players and inform them of what's going on. Likewise, this area doesn't have very much in the way of side quests. It exists primarily as a vessel to move the Sabbat story forward and take you down an alternate path to the endgame. Now normally I'd be disappointed by something like this, but I really can't be considering the sheer amount of story content that you get from these linear Sabbat quests themselves. It took me about three hours to go through this entire area from first stepping foot into it to leaving with my new pack in tow, and not one minute of that time felt as if it dragged on or was lacking in anything interesting. And the mod keeps on giving with ongoing character development as you progress through the campaign as well. If you keep talking to your pack mates as you go on through the rest of the game, new story branches pop pop up and you learn a little more about them. It's a really interesting dive into the psyche of some of the new characters that are introduced. 
furthermore, you're able to use those pack mates as companions when you go to the new missions in the game, such as the Giovanni Mansion, or in an entirely recut sequence where you confront Professor Johansson in the Empire Hotel. This turns these areas into bloodbaths, but as somebody who's always playing these games really socially or really stealthily, it was really nice to kind of get that change of pace and have some backup while doing it. It was cool to see my pack run roughshod all over the Giovanni on their own turf. Alternatively, you could tell them to stay behind if you want to approach these areas the old-fashioned way. And if you choose to continue playing the game as a loyal toady of the Camarilla, don't worry. The mod still gives you a chance to explore East LA at the behest of Prince LaCroix after you kill Bach and return to him. The path differs slightly based on your approach than if you were doing this as a member of the Sabbat, but the grand majority of the content is the same. And as you may expect, doing all this is well worth the effort because you're rewarded with a brand new ending as well. What surprised me about this was that I got an extra dialogue option in the final confrontation because I was curious enough to ask Victoria about the Sabbat and their customs earlier on. I won't go into too much detail talking about the endings here, but needless to say, one of them is very appropriate if you're familiar at all with Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, and even though I knew what to expect, I still had a smile on my face. If you're curious to see the game's new endings, I'm going to post them to my second channel, links in the description below. Also, I'm going to leave links to the downloads for the Clan Quest mod and its documentation, the X20 mod, and the unofficial patch. Check them all out. At the end of the day, the Sabbat chapter is a very well-written chronicle designed by somebody who knows what the sect is all about, and it shows a deep appreciation for Vampire the Masquerade as a whole. For fans of the sect, such as myself, there is a lot to love here, and it was an absolute treat to go through it in addition to the original clan quests. And if your knowledge of Vampire the Masquerade comes solely from Bloodlines, and that's not a bad thing, we all need to get our start somewhere, the Clan Quest mod does a beautiful job of introducing these deeper layers of lore in such a way that it doesn't feel overwhelming or through boring exposition dumps. There are a few things to keep in mind about this mod, however. For one, because it's pushing the game's engine to the brink, there may be times when the game crashes or even fails to load entire areas. The solution for this is to use the console to load the game map, and then reload your game and then enter in normally so you don't lose your stuff the way you do if you teleport to a new map using console commands. Furthermore, there are times when character asset AI breaks and they don't pose properly. Cutscenes may play out awkwardly, or even may get stuck on occasion, forcing you to reload the entire area. This mod isn't perfect, and Bloodlines is already hella buggy anyway, so expect to see these errors when you come into the game. And to kind of expand on that comment, the mod actually isn't in active development anymore, at least for the time being. While Burgermeister 01 may come back and revisit it one day, what you see with this mod is what you get. But, you know, after spending a decade toiling over it and packing it with as much content as it has, I don't think that there's much more that can be added without significantly overhauling what's already there. In all honesty, if this is the final version of the Clan Quest mod that we get, I'm perfectly okay with that, since it's very mature and it offers so much to do. And that's especially given the size of the team involved in making this content in the first place. So, with all that being said, I thoroughly stand by my statement and say that the Clan Quest mod is the best overhaul that you can get for Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. While the unofficial patch may be more essential, nothing expands the game's content and gameplay the way that CQM does. Like I said at the beginning of the video, it is the closest thing that we have ever gotten to an expansion pack for the game, and I still think that, while it's usually a good idea to experience a game as close to vanilla as possible the first time through, I think the Clan Quest mod is good enough that you should at least consider using it, especially if you have no intention of ever playing the game more than once. Although when it comes to Bloodlines, why you wouldn't want to experience it multiple times is utter madness if you ask me. It's still generally my go-to mod more often than not, and I'm always finding new things as I explore its content. I think the benefits and the additions of the mod far outweigh its drawbacks, like having that older version of the unofficial patch, but since the game is mod foldered, there's nothing stopping you from installing this and the unofficial patch or whatever other mods you want to use and then just using whichever one catches your fancy. In any case, I wholly encourage that you give this mod a go for your next playthrough of Bloodlines. It is utterly sublime, and it has a standard of quality that other mods can only dream of. I think you should really give it a go, and if you do, I don't think you're going to be disappointed.